This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Welcome, everybody, back to the Human Action Podcast. Uh, before I transition to our guest and let him introduce himself to you good folks, let me just remind you that on November 9th, 2024, the Mises Institute is going to be hosting an event in Fort Myers, Florida, titled Elections in the Economy, Do They Really Matter? It's going to be uh, featuring talks from Tom DiLorenzo, Mark Thornton, and Murray Sabrin. And so they're going to challenge prevailing economic myths and take a critical look at the U.S. political theater, offering insights into how political interventions distort our economy. It's an opportunity to move beyond partisan rhetoric and examine the way the government affects our lives and livelihoods. So if you're interested, go to Mises.org slash Fort Myers 24, and that's Mises.org slash F-T-M-Y-E-R-S-2-4 to get further details. So for today's discussion, I am joined by Jason Purcell. Jason, thanks so much for joining us. And can you maybe tell the listeners a bit about your background and why you're qualified to talk about this topic we're going to jump into? Thanks for having me on. Uh, I never thought that, you know, Five years ago, when I was watching Mises U on YouTube, I didn't think I would be on the Mises Institute's podcast, so it's pretty cool. Um, so a little bit about me. I've got a bachelor's in economics, um, which, as you probably know, at most universities, that's a uh, bachelor's in Keynesianism, basically. Um, so I didn't even know that the Austrian school existed until I got out of college. Ended up getting a job in finance, and then once I started working in finance, I got my master's uh, in that subject. So that was pretty cool. Um, so I work for a major U.S. financial institution. If you really want to know the exact name, uh, I'm not going to you know, go shouting about my employer on the podcast. But if you uh, can track me down on LinkedIn, it's very obvious who I work for. So if you really want to know, you know, you just go there. Um, so most of what I do is called trade lifecycle management in the industry. So myself and the team that I'm on of eight other people, we're responsible for managing a uh, portfolio of positions that ranges anywhere between 350 and $500 billion notional. That includes interest rate derivatives, short and long-term debt, repurchase agreements, and bond investments. Uh, the maturity of those assets and liabilities are anywhere between one day and uh, 30 years. Um, okay. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll maybe motivate, like, because I, I saw from your note, like, as to how you got into this particular controversy. So folks, uh, for your knowledge... There's plenty of people who are, I'm trying to think of the way to describe it. They're very free market friendly. Uh, you know, in other words, they personally don't like government intervention in the economy or the financial sector, um, you know, big on sound money and things like that in terms of that. Yep. That's the ethical thing to do that, you know, our country and the world would be on a much more solid footing if we had sound money and so forth. Um, but they do try to take an open mind and particularly the guys that are giving guidance to investors, like from that specific angle, a lot of times, you know, and, and I think they're correct to do so. They'll say, look, we don't want to be blindsided or, or misled by ideology. We just got to go with where the, the data take us. And so one of these guys in particular is George Gammon, uh, Rebel Capitalist podcast, you know, great guy, but on his show, I, I've had him on, I think here and then other podcasts that I host a few times. And lately he has been on Twitter uh, asking the question earnestly saying, guys, I don't understand. How can it be that the fed is responsible for all these economic distortions and like the, the price inflation and so on, when depending on certain metrics, you know, it looks like it doesn't have that much of an impact. So one thing that George had been saying is, Hey, between 1980 and 2007, I think that those were the benchmarks he picked. It, it looks like bank, bank reserves haven't done too much, which, which is true. So to be clear, like the monetary base, steadily rose throughout that that period but the component of it that has to do with bank reserves actually didn't go up over the whole time you know and in fact there were periods where it kind of just tread waters and i so you know i told george yeah i'm gonna go do more some research on that so while george is asking these questions and then he was also just just challenging in general saying you know the idea of the inverted yield curve being the fault of the fed or whatever or just in general the notion that the Fed keeps interest rates artificially low. I'm not so sure, you know, we should believe that. Or, or So he's not saying it like he did, but he's just kind of saying, uh, 
somebody convinced me. And then, you know, some people would try, including me, and he mm -hmm. would come up with things about, well, no, something else could explain that particular data that you just showed me. And the one that he found most convincing, and I thought it was intriguing as well, um, Jason, was this the data set that you presented. So can you maybe, now that I've given the listeners a bit of context, can you maybe explain, you know, what, what, what you started to do to, to answer George's as he threw the gauntlet down, as it were? Right. Yeah. Uh, that's a good way to put it. So a lot of uh, folks who are kind of aligned with that argument as well in talking about the Fed and its influence on short term interest rates. Another thing they'll commonly say is, well, the Fed doesn't really control interest rates, even at the short term of their own free will. What they're really doing is the treasury market kind of leads them in a certain direction and then they follow it. So sometimes people will point out, I think I've heard one of your uh, guests, this is probably a long time ago, say this too, but they'll point out, well, if you really look at the graph, you know, the day, the day to day data, uh, you might notice that oftentimes before the Fed cuts rates, you'll see the three month T bill yield start to drop a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you hear that uh, a lot too. But so when I was kind of just trying to think about this question, um, I had known about this particular data set for a while and it looked at di different things in it. It's the NBER macro history um, database for anybody who's a uh, you know, data nerd and just wants to look at some interesting stuff. Um, but I thought, okay, what's sort of a data or historical approach to answering this question about you know, the central bank's influence over interest rates? And I just thought, okay, one way that we could approach this is just look at the way that interest rates behaved prior to when the Fed existed, um, maybe even overlay the, you know, versus after the Fed existed. And then you can also just kind of think about it in terms of maybe you do have a Fed from 1914 onward, but what the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England really and the other central banks are using those policy interest rates for is actually quite different up until 1930. So the policy rate, you know, what the Bank of England is using the discount rate for, you know, up until uh, about basically the interwar era is quite different to what it's doing for the 100, 150 years before that. Um, and, and so the interesting thing that came out of that is, you know, what struck me is that you've talked about this a lot. You've done multiple episodes on the yield curve. Um, and what struck me about it is that this positive term premium, so-called, or the typical behavior that we see with the yield curve, which is the upward slope that we all tend to think of as normal, if you plot the data back further than just the post-World War II era, suddenly that doesn't look so normal anymore. Um, unfortunately, just one last thing, and then I'll cut, and then if, if you have any further comment, um, but just I want to give the caveats to doing that sort of analysis, and, and mm -hmm. those are with both the UK market in the U.S. market that we're looking at. So the U.K., we have data going all the way back to 1753 on the difference between short-term yields or short-term interest rates and long-term uh, government interest rates. And then in the U.S., we have that information um, from 1871. But the limitation is that we don't have a yield curve in the true sense from those older time periods. Because with both governments, they really didn't start to issue treasury bills until the early 1920s. So we're talking post-World War I. And so to have a true yield curve, you have to have instruments with the same issuer. So you can get close. What, I'm, what I've done is to use proxies. Um, and we'll talk about what those proxies are. So you can get pretty close, I think. But we don't, in the truest sense, have a real yield curve because we don't have a treasury bill and a long-term treasury note from either the U.S. or the U.K. governments until the 1920s. So that's one limitation of this analysis that, you know, anybody who has looked at it is going to throw out immediately and say, oh, that's just credit risk. So I just wanted to point that out, you know, yeah, let me, Jason, further. let me stop you uh, as I'm wont to do in these things to sure. make sure we're not losing the, you know, somebody who doesn't really isn't in the weeds on this. Yeah. Um, so what, what we mean by a yield curve folks is maybe I'll make a time to stamp here. Maybe we'll, we'll flash up something like from Wikipedia or something just to, to go along with my narration. Yeah. Uh, the standard five. yield curve, it's plotting the maturity on the what X axis and the, in the yield on the Y axis. And typically it slopes upward 
and uh, me- meaning so that the like, oh, if you're going to, let's say it's the U.S. government. So if I'm going to lend gov- money to the government for three months, they're going to give me a certain interest rate. If I'm willing to lend them money for 10 years, then you know the rate's going to be possibly different, 30 years and, and so forth. And so normally the rate you get from the U.S. government, if you're buying their bonds, meaning you're lending money to them, uh, goes up the longer they have to pay you back, if that makes sense, the longer the length of the loan, if you want to think of it that way. And by the way, with all this stuff, folks, it's it's uh, calculated and expressed in annualized terms, right? So obviously, you get more total interest if you lend them money for 30 years than if you lend them money for a month. But the point is, even on an annualized rate, the quote normal upward sloping yield curve means even per year your percentage yield is higher on a typically like a ten year loan versus a three month one, um, and then just another bit of nomenclature. When so when Jason's saying the the t the bills weren't issued until the twenties, the the way the stuff the bill means is it less than a year? Is that how they do it in the UK too? I know that's in, in the US. That's the nomenclature. Yeah, yeah. So anything less than a year is a bill, and mm-hmm. so yeah, it's just it's a bond. So just think of it as a bond that is less than a year. And then yeah. a note is anything between one year and 10 years. And then and then 10 years and higher is what they typically call treasury. <laughs> Long bond. Bonds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, so that, that's the distinction. So his point was when you're, if you're just trying to isolate the impact of the, the difference in maturities, like how, the length of the loan, and you want to say, oh, if, if I'm, if my money's going to be tied up for longer before I get my principal back, then you know what happens to the the interest rate that I get paid again in an annualized basis. Well, to to keep it apples to apples, it's got to be the same issuer, right? You wouldn't say, well, gee, if I lent money to the government for three months, or I lent money to some tech company that's got a bunch of twenty two year olds running it for ten years, and the and the rates are different, that must just be because of the time lag. Well, no, it could also be because it's a riskier loan to the tech company, and so you know you you have to be promised a higher yield to do that, right? So. The point is to really be apples to apples and to know that it's a yield curve that's just isolating the difference in maturity and not the credit worthiness of the borrower. You know, you want it to be the same lender. And Jason's point is to say, oh, the spread between, let's say, the 10-year and the three-month on U.S. government bonds that are issued, is it was that, you know, was it always upward sloping historically, like even in the late 1800s? And he's saying, well, we don't know because the U.S. government didn't issue three-month treasury bills in the late 1800s. And right, so that's why exactly. we, to try to get a sense of, okay, what was the spread between very safe short-term loans and presumably safe long-term loans to the government, for example, what did that spread look like in the year 1885? And so there we can't look at, oh, what's the T-bill yield because it didn't exist. But so now you're going to talk about the proxies, like what what did you use to try to substitute in for what the T-bill yield was? Yeah. So so one thing that we do notice is that, uh, well, I'll start with what we have. So we have commercial paper rates, uh, New York, fin- and commercial paper is basically a T-bill, but issued by an entity that's not the government, right? So uh, we're sometimes called a discount note in my industry. So it's basically the same thing as far as the mathematics and the economics of it. It's just not issued by the government. So you wouldn't consider it a risk-free interest rate. So we have commercial paper, and we do have that all the way back to 1871, which is when our series on long-term bond yields also starts. So we can compare privately issued commercial paper, which is usually put out there in the market by the prevailing uh, investment banks and commercial banks of the day. They were the ones uh, issuing a lot of that commercial paper in New York. So we can compare the New York commercial paper rate to the yield on long-term U.S. government bonds. So that's what we have for the U.S. going back to about 1871. In the U.K., we do get a little bit closer to risk-free. Actually, I would say quite a bit closer to risk-free because the U.K. has had a central bank since uh, 1694. And since 1694, they have had an interest rate. And so from uh, and then in 1753, uh, the UK started issuing, you know, the, the exchequer started to issue console bonds. So if you think about a long term US government bond as being 30 years to maturity, the interesting thing about a console is that the 
uh, effectively the term is infinite. So a console bond never actually matures. Uh, the, the government is just selling you this thing and then it pays you interest every, I think the original ones were three months or excuse me, 3%. Um, but it's very interesting because it's effectively a bond with infinite maturity. It it never mm -hmm. matures. And so what it what so, gives so it just its to be value, clear, if you mm -hmm. lent the British government a thousand pounds, they right. would just pay you thirty pounds forever. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so what gave those their market value is just the fact that other people would pay for them. Right. I mean, <laughs> that's that's literally it. So you could lend the British government a thousand pounds and they'll you know, you could receive the 30 pounds in interest every year. Um, but you could also just sell it to somebody else and they would pay you close to a thousand pounds for it. Um, I don't know if that's because investors have historically thought eventually you might get the principal back or if it's just the fact that. You know, some things really do just have value because, as we know, because value is subjective, right? Some things really do just have value because you can sell it to somebody else. So from the UK, we have uh, the Bank of England's discount rate, uh, which is often called bank rate. And we can compare that to the uh, yield on console bonds, which is kind of like, you know, Britain's analog of a 10-year or 30-year government bond. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and so what you find when you do that is that the upward sloping nature of the yield curve, this phenomenon where the normal thing that we see is for a three month security to pay a lower interest rate than say a 10 year or a long term security, that really doesn't come about until the early 1930s. And so that there's a, a few different avenues. There's a few different things you can look at to kind of sift out what's going on there. Um, I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that, and also, excuse me, sorry. I do think it's going to be useful. Like on, on my own website, I'll put up a, uh, a little post with all the visuals that we talk about today. I, I do think, you know, a lot of people are probably just going to listen to this, uh, audio wise and it's probably going to help you if maybe after the episode you just scroll through and say oh yeah that's what they were talking well, about also assuming we have your permission jason we'll post some screenshot like for the video sure. version like as okay. we're doing this so yeah, yeah like great. right now in terms of, is it useful like if we flash the uh what i'm the the top one that you know you you've got the 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 two different series mm -hmm. yeah we can do that. Stuff? okay yeah so well i'll we'll make sure we post that so yeah, assuming the people watching the video, I mean, try to keep in mind there are some people in their car driving and they're just listening to the audio, but yeah, can you like talk us through that first, that that top graph, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so because the sample is longer, we'll just go ahead and start with the, what's going on in the UK. So from 1753 to the beginning of the series to almost 25 years later, there's actually a negative, what's called a term premium between the two interest rates on that graph. So the term premium is the difference between the long term and the short term interest rates that you're looking at. Um, and another way of saying negative term premium is the curve is inverted, the term structure is inverted. What, all we're, we, what we mean by that is the short term interest rate is uh, higher than the long term interest rate. That condition persists for 25 straight years. And the other interesting thing about that is that the is that the Bank of England doesn't change their bank rate the entire time. It just stays uh, whatever it is. I want to say it's four percent, something like that. Um, let's see. So it, uh, I believe it's 5%. So it just stays at 5% the entire time. And for that first 25 years in the data set, the quote unquote term structure is constantly inverted. So the long-term bond yield is always well below that rate. And it's, uh, inverted by a good two, like between 1.5 and 2%. So it's, it's pretty deep. Um, then in the sort of middle of this data set, you're, so you're talking about the 1840s onward, I noticed that there was quite a lot of volatility in the bank rate that you don't see before that point. And I was just trying to think, like rack my brain for, you know, history of the Bank of England. Okay, what would explain that? And what's going on here, I believe, what, what does a pretty good job of explaining this is in 1844, you have the Peels Act. 
Now, the Peels Act did a lot of things, but among other things, it made the Bank of England the only valid issuer of uh, of banknotes in the UK. So before that, they had not exactly a free banking system, but all the different private banks could issue their own notes. With 1844, the Peels Act, only the Bank of England can issue notes. It's given a monopoly. And then the other thing that happens is that the Bank of England is only allowed to issue about 14 million pounds in notes over the amount of gold that it has in the vault or the amount of gold and silver. And so what that means is that, you know, any time that the Bank of England is uh, making a loan to a bank, what it's doing is it's creating another liability. And oftentimes it's issuing more notes anytime it does that. So one way that the Bank of England can uh, regulate its gold stock, make sure that it, that not too much of its gold flows out, or really control the amount of notes that it's putting into circulation, is by changing that discount rate. Uh, mm-hmm. So the so the way the bank rate works essentially is that. Uh, what banks are doing in the UK at the time is they're funding international trade, and that's done with these bills, uh, what's, what are called bills of exchange. Now, what people would do if they had a bill of exchange, um, which a bill of exchange is think of like a post-dated check. So it's, a, it's an IOU. It says that this importer will pay this exporter in 90 days. What a lot of people did was they would take their bill of exchange to a bank and they would get a stamp on it that says acceptance. And then in exchange for that, which is basically a guarantee. So that bill was now guaranteed by the bank. So that now becomes the bank's responsibility to pay that obligation in the event that the person on the other side of that trade doesn't, uh, you know, defaults or doesn't pay or whatever. Now, what the banks could do if they got into trouble because the banks are usually sitting on tons and tons and tons of these acceptances that they're obli- that they're obliged to pay. If the bank got into trouble and they needed cash because maybe they have a customer they need to pay out notes to, they can take it to the Bank of England. And the Bank of England is going to strip out the discount rate in order to give them cash for that acceptance. So the discount rate Really, and all that is just to say that in this time period, the discount rate really is like the risk free rate that like or the, uh, you know, the base rate for all financial transactions. Um, Any other kind of commercial paper that's issued by a company in this environment, any debt that's issued by a bank, it's all going to be bank rate plus usually 25, you know, somewhere between 25 and 50 basis points. So this bank rate really is the risk-free rate. And so the reason- If I'm not mistaken, like that's, that's kind of like where that phrase discount rate comes from. Like it's discounting the the bill of exchange. Exactly. Right. Okay. Like they're not paying- par for it because there's they're taking on some risk and so it's a lower so oh yeah you're buying it at a discount or they just discounted the you know that would be the verb you would use and so that's exactly why. oh that it what's the rate at which you would do oh it's the discount rate and, you know mm-hmm. I, i'm just saying that because i know when i was first getting into this stuff like i didn't like what, what you know i understood like the window but they called it the discount window like, what, what does that mean you know and then i mm-hmm. so anyway just for people who want to know where those words come from like i think this is why and also yeah, just exactly. a quick thing too the Robert, you know, Peel's act from Robert Peel, that also has a significance in a lot of Mises' writings because they they understood, like the you know the theorists that Peel was relying on for that legislation, they, they understood that oh, you you want to have backed b- banknote issue, and so that's what the what it required that you know if a, if a commercial bank issues more notes, you know that says oh the the bearer of this note can turn in any branch of our banks and get a certain amount of gold or silver that they, they have to be backed by, you know, coin in the vault, but they didn't apply that to what we would call demand deposits, like, like checking accounts. It was just for the the bank notes. And so that, you know, Mises said that was a grave theoretical error. And then, so since it didn't prevent business cycles, then people said, Oh, see, they must've been wrong. And, and Mises said, right. no, they weren't wrong. It was just, they didn't realize that they should have also included what we, you know, what we call now demand deposits. So, okay. But that's just yeah. kind of an aside. Yeah. It was def- uh, definitely considered a win for like the hard money school. And then, but they didn't, re- they didn't regulate the creation of bank money. They only 
uh, they only regulated the creation of central bank, well, yeah, central bank money. Um, but it didn't do anything as far as how much the individual private banks could expand credit off of that monetary base. So, uh, yeah. And so what's going on here is that, it, and I think the point just to drive home about this era. So we're talking about basically, uh, 70, 80 years, the primary purpose of the discount rate is not to try and influence the macro economy, right? What we know today in the post-war era, or even in the post-Great Depression era, is that when the, you know, when the economy gets in trouble, then the Fed cuts rates because they believe that that supports uh, low unemployment or whatever, right? Back then, that's not their priority at all. All they're trying to do is protect their gold stock. And the same is true of the Federal Reserve when they, uh, when the Federal Reserve first starts operating, the, the primary purpose of the discount rate is also to make sure that they keep, you know, they have to keep a 40% gold reserve. So most of the motivation behind their usage of a discount rate as well is not trying to influence macroeconomic outcomes. It's just regulating this ratio between uh, the, the central bank's assets and liabilities, the gold reserve and the note issue, the gold reserve and the, you know, amount of bank reserves. And then, so what we see during this time, uh, during, this would be considered part of the heyday of kind of the classical gold standard as well. Um, but the average spread between the, you know, between the Bank of England's discount rate and the console yield is negative 0.56%. So the average is negative and the term structure is inverted 64% of the time. So it's definitely more so than normal to see the short-term rates higher than the long-term rates um, during, uh, you know, not an overwhelming majority. It's 64%, but it's definitely a lot more normal than it is now. Okay. So again, we'll flash this, the screen. So you're saying like in that middle chunk, mm -hmm. uh, you can see that the blue line is typically higher than the orange line, which again, meaning that the interest rate you would get on very short-term loans is higher than if you just gave a thousand pounds to the British government and, you know, how much interest are they going to give you perpetually? Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, in the period, I don't think I gave the, the averages in the period before that, but from 1753 to 1844, so the beginning of consul bonds all the way up until the Peels Act, basically, the time that that term structure is inverted is 88% of the time, and the average spread is a negative 0.8. So it's even more, uh, you know, if, if you uh, open up the chart and look at it, it's, that one's very, very obvious. So then what we see after that is we get into the post-war era, um, or excuse me, the interwar eras, you know, basically between World War I and World War II. Great Depression comes along, both the United States and the UK, which we'll, I guess we can walk through the uh, US chart here in a minute. Um, but just sticking with the UK chart, they cut rates to 2%, which is basically the lowest level it's ever been at. There were a few times during the 19th century that it touched that level, um, but had not been there in for such a long, drawn-out time period for quite a long time. And a, key, a couple of key developments that happen during the 1930s is that all of these countries, whether you're talking about, uh, well, I don't want to, I don't know a, a good, uh, I don't have a good working roster of the gold standard and European countries in my brain. So let's just, but I do know that France and the UK uh, both went off the gold standard and I think they both went off in 1931. Uh, but I know for a fact the UK went off in 1931. So you have this situation and then the US stopped their internal gold standard in 1933. So you have this situation in which the policy rate that they're using no longer has to be used to protect the gold stock, right? Um, the central bank's only limitation essentially is price inflation, and their experience with price inflation is that they basically haven't had any since World War I, right? Um, in both the U.S. and the U.K., uh, in the U.S., prices were pretty much flat from the 
you know, after you kind of had the inflation of 1919, 1920, uh, there was a big deflation with that 1920 recession, and then prices were basically flat until the Great Depression, and then they dropped off a cliff. So all these all these central bankers know during that time is deflation, so they're not really particularly concerned about inflation, and they don't have to protect the gold stock using rates anymore. Um, so their decision-making apparatus is quite different. You also have a – you also lose in 1928 and 29 or maybe it's 29 and 30. You lose both Montague Norman and Benjamin Strong. So the guys who are heading the central banks in both England and uh, the U.S. are both gone. And they get replaced by people who I would I would argue are more kind of macroeconomic thinking kind of guys. Uh, you have Eccles in – in the U.S. and the name of of uh, Norman's replacement in the U.K. is is escaping me right now, but I'll have to look that up and put it in in some notes. Um, but you get a change at the helm of the Fed too um, from these guys who have, you know, they've been governing their central banks in the World War One kind of nineteen twenties era. So you have this big leadership change. And so they and, – and this happens in the U.S. too. Both of these central banks, they drop rates to uh, the lowest levels that they've ever seen. And then you get this highly – or you get this large uh, upward slope in the yield curve after that. Uh, so now you have a, a considerable difference between short-term rates and long-term rates, and the long-term rates are quite a bit higher than the short-term. And then what we notice is that after 1930, it just – kind of stays that way, right? So the upward sloping curve is the norm. Um, every, you know, whenever there's a recession, basically what's going on is the, or excuse me, there's inversion here and there. And what's going on is that the central bank is jacking up their uh, policy rate. And then that inverts the yield curve. And then you have a recession. Uh, but by and large, the norm is for the yield curve to have a big, uh, a steep upward slope. And so in the time period 1930 to 2017, uh, when you look at that spread between the bank rate and console yields, you're looking at a positive spread on average of about uh, four fifths, and it's only inverted about 30% of the time. So that's a big, um, you know, just big change in the in the structure of those interest rates that happens right basically in line with the Great Depression. So I'll kind of stop rambling there if you want to jump yeah, in. Yeah, so let me make sure we're not losing people and then mm -hmm. we'll go to the U.S. case, you know, to, to sort of buttress this. But big picture, you know, what what's the – besides, oh, this is interesting stuff. What's the what's the punchline? Why, why was even George Gammon saying, oh, this is the best evidence I've seen to push back, you know, against my question uh, or my, you know, uh, hypothetical criticism of the Austrian approach? And so – Again, big picture that f with this history of the Bank of England, again, I'm just reading off your statistics here. Be between 1753 and 1840, the average spread was negative 0 0.82. Then from 1854 to 1930, it was negative 0 0.56. But then from 1930 to 2017, it's a positive 0 0.79. And again, that spread is between the, the console yield and the Bank of England bank rate. And so those two periods when it was negative, meaning short rates were typically during those long stretches higher than long rates. And then it was only in the more recent period, like 20th century, specifically like, you know, post World War One, that it's, oh no, the quote normal thing for the yield curve would be upward sloping, meaning that, you know, the spread was positive. And so the, the takeaway is clearly we know in the earlier period, there was much less intervention into money by the by the authorities whereas clearly you know the more recent period is where you know there were central banks that existed for one thing and then you know we're actively intervening more especially in terms of guiding macroeconomic events and so to to say like so what evidence do we have that this the existence and activity of modern central banks pushes down interest rates to artificially low levels you're saying well if that were true, then what we would expect to see. So, so one thing, I guess, a part of your argument that we, did, I guess, we didn't spell out was that most people agree that 
central banks have more influence over short-term rates than long-term rates. And maybe mm-hmm. in a minute we can we can justify that claim. But just go with me, folks, for this. Assume that you believe that for a second. So then what would the, what would the world look like? What would the data look like if it were the case that when central banks come on the scene, they start pushing down interest rates artificially low relative to what they would have been in a, in a freer market? And the idea is, well, I guess you would see that short rates would get pushed down so the whatever the normal spread was between you know long rates and short rates would would it would increase and so if historically you see oh they used actually used to be negative that the short rates used to be higher and then they got they fell below the long rates that's exactly what it would look like if the standard austrian story is correct is that are, mm-hmm. are you okay with how i just said that yeah yeah absolutely that's perfect and um yeah, and just to put that into one sentence, it's basically like if the if the central banks are unable to affect short term interest rates, or they're just acting as a market otherwise would, right? Because that's kind of the, what we're really trying to get at is does right. the central bank make it so that markets behave in ways other than they would without the influence of the central bank? Well, then when I look at the term structure of interest rates before the central banks really get in and start using them for these you know, macroeconomic policy means, I would expect that term structure from 1753 to 1930 to look very similar to how it does now, right? I I would expect to go back and see, ah, yes, there is usually a positive term premium. Usually the short-term security pays a lower interest rate than the long-term security. And then maybe whenever there's a recession coming, uh, well, actually, I don't even, I don't know if I would expect it to invert because, you know, the central bank's not there to, you know, try to fight inflation and jack the short rate up. So maybe it would invert, maybe it wouldn't, but I would expect to see that upward slope, uh, that in other words, a positive term premium that most people in the business think is normal. I would say like 99% of people in the business believe is normal. I would expect to see that across time, you know, and we're looking at 250 years here. Um, so yeah, I would, I would expect that shape to be, to be very similar in, 1755, 1855, and 1955, you know, and mm-hmm. 2020. And so um, this, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's it. So what I was going to say is, in, in those, this dovetails with my, uh, I guess, theory that, or, or by my attempted reconciliation. So again, folks, there's a well documented historical pattern in the U.S. For example, uh, I think if you start in the early 60s. Going forward, anytime the yield curve inverted, uh, I think there's one s- false negative or something like that. Yeah, and even there, it was it was borderline. It was like there was a slowdown, but technically they didn't clock it as a recession or something. So that, and other than that, though, there's no false positives, no false negatives. Every time the yield curve inverts, if you define it, you know, in a certain way, like what do we mean by to say did it, and what's you know which which two benchmarks are you using that kind of thing. Um, then yes, there has been a recession and not like, oh, eight years later. Like if you just look at the graph, the chart of it, it it jumps out at you. And I'll, I'll put a link folks uh, to the article. I did an article with Ryan Griggs on this for the uh, quarterly journal of Austrian economics, just spelling it out. And we linked it to standard Austrian business cycle theory. So just intuitively, the idea was saying that makes sense, right? So, so Mises didn't talk about inverted yield curves as far as I ever remember, but in terms of that pattern, if you be, if you independently believed already in Austrian business cycle theory, it wouldn't be surprising what would kind of pop out of that is that, oh, during the unsustainable boom period, when the banks are pumping in unbacked credit that's you know artificially depressing interest rates, once you get more specific and say, well, wait a minute, though, it probably pushes down short rates more than it pushes down long rates. If anything, the extra inflation might lead investors to expect higher price inflation. So maybe long rates could even go up, you know, go up. but, but certainly, you know, the influx of extra credit pushes down short-term rates for borrowers. So you would expect to have a quote, normal upward sloping yield curve. So the point was maybe what we think of in the post world war II era is normal upward sloping yield curve is actually saying, this is what it looks like when you're in the midst of an unsustainable boom. Mm-hmm. And that it's right when you're getting close to the crash that, Oh, all of a sudden the yield curve inverts because the central bank slams on the brakes and, 
and that makes short rates spike and they go up above long rates. And everyone says, oh my gosh, the yield curve inverted. I wonder if a recession's coming. I wonder why. Maybe it's because animal spirits When No, if you understand Austrian business, like, it's like, yeah, that's exactly what you'd expect to happen. Right. right? So, but if that's true, then, you know, that answers George Gammon's thing about what do you mean they sub- depress rates artificially? Well, you know, that's what we're talking about. But then to say, oh, so if we were looking at a more laissez-faire environment, whether, you know, a central bank didn't exist or it was more just operating to make sure the gold stock didn't get depleted, then you wouldn't see that. It's not that during normal times you'd be in the midst of an unsustainable boom where short rates are really artificially low. And that's why, like in the charts we've been flashing, you could say, oh, so maybe it, it, it is, quote, normal that short rates could be higher than the console yield because – and maybe that's the thing too, Jason, just if – when people try to walk through, you know, the, the reasons for, you know, why is it that we think it's normal – for short rates to be lower than long rates, a lot of the explanations people give, and again, I want to be clear, it's it's not because, oh, well, if your money's tied up for longer, because we're annualizing it. So we're just saying, why is the annual rate that you get on your loan higher the longer you're willing to lend in a, quote, normal upward sloping environment? And the reasons people mm-hmm. give is stuff like, well, because there's so much uncertainty. But I think a lot of that, and this is what fueled my interest in this stuff, Jason, like when I was in grad school or just came out, I was doing research just on the kind of stuff. Your data is better than what I dug up, but I I did kind of approximate what you were doing here, and I thought that yeah, I don't this this whole normal upward sloping yield curve. I think that's a, a relatively modern thing. Mm-hmm. That because the normal reasons they give about oh yeah, because there's so much you know, geez, you don't know what's going to happen thirty years out, and mm-hmm. and now the UK government doesn't even do consoles anymore. Right? Because that'd be crazy. They're like oh, we're just going to be on the hook forever. And so my <laughs> point was yeah, because exactly. central banks. So such instability, yes. That yeah, you can't. Your everyone's planning horizons now are shorter. Like yeah, the idea of an infinitely long loan, like who would want that? But they yeah. did back in the day under the gold standard with the British Empire, and you know everything seemed very stable. And yeah, why couldn't things continue like this for centuries? Yeah, they did. In in the in the Cato Institute, uh, long I think it was 2013, like the hundred year anniversary of the Fed, when they published their paper, uh, has the Fed been a failure? There's two really interesting things that they point out, which I think also serve as evidence, uh, not not maybe as exacting evidence as as what we're looking at here, but towards this broader point of like yes, the central banks do have a whole lot of power over how interest rates behave. But two of the things that they pointed out are, okay, interest rates are obviously more volatile in the post-Fed period than they were Mm. in the pre-Fed period. I mean, they're just, it's so freaking obvious, (laughs) right? (laughs) Um, Which is interesting because one of the things in the original Federal Reserve Act was uh, provide for stable long-term interest rates. You know, you know, it didn't start with uh, low unemployment and stable prices. It was, there were other requirements like furnishing a market for commercial paper and bankers acceptances and all this. But one of the things they pointed out was we want uh, stable long-term interest rates. And it's like, okay, you got your central bank and they've done the opposite. Um, So yeah, rates are more volatile. And then they also point out that it was very common back then for even a well-established corporation to issue a 50-year bond. It was very common Mm -hmm. for a kingdom in Europe to issue a century-long bond. The UK had infinite, you know, like you pointed out, the console itself, you know, never paid its principal and nobody does that anymore. You know, the average maturity has gone down since we've had more intervention in in interest rates. So I also think that those, you know, those aren't exactly as direct points as kind of this uh, analysis of the term structure, you know, pre and post. Uh, But I think that those little anecdotes are also, you know, quite strong evidence that of the central bankers influence over how rates behave and, you know, what. Is, has that been a net good or a net uh, negative, you know? Right. I think right. most people would agree. Actually, when you said that, that jogged my memory. That's more specifically what I was looking at back when I was, again, I, I can't remember if I was still in grad, because I know I was at NYU, but after I got my degree and left and I taught at Hillsdale, and then I went back for a postdoc kind of appointment thing. So I can't remember which period, if I was like, still a grad student or if it was that, but that's partly what I was doing. I was actually trying to figure out like the, the uh, the predictability of interest rates, mm-hmm. did, you know, was that higher or lower over time? And so, uh, and I had uncovered some evidence suggesting that, yeah, that they were more predictable, you know, in 1880 than that they were, whatever, in 1970. 
Okay, just look at the clock here. We got to be fast, but j- sure. can you just will flash up the uh, you know the the New York commercial paper rates versus the U.S. ten year? And can you just if someone's just looking at that, can you just kind of give a you know two minute overview of, of the whole graph and what they're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have New York commercial paper and then a uh, long term U.S. government bond yield. Basically, you see that in the period up until the interwar years, or uh, we we can look at 1871 to 1913. So you're talking about pre Fed. Uh, so the average spread during that time is about 1.3 percent. It's inverted 87% of the time. So same pattern that we see in the UK uh, from 1914 to 1929, which is what I would call a central bank, but different central bank policy time. Um, Again, the central banks are not concerned with manipulating the macro economy using their policy rate. What they're trying to do is regulate the gold stock and keep their reserve ratio. Um, So during this time, it's... I would say significantly less inverted, um, but it still is. So you got negative 0.74% is the average spread. Um, and then you've got, you know, it's it's negative 76% of the time. And then from 1930 to present, uh, again, we go through the Great Depression. We have this period uh, where the central banks start to manipulate rates as a tool of macroeconomic policy. The average spread is 1%. Um, so that's a full 2.3 above where it is in the you know, up to 1913, I would say that's pretty extreme. And then um, the cur- and the term structure is only inverted for about a fifth of the time, about 20%. And then if you look at the chart of the spread that itself, uh, the 10 year uh, minus the commercial paper rate, you know, the first time that you really get this large upward slope is in the early 30s. So between 1931 and 1934. And you didn't see anything that positive until this era. Um, And I think that that's a really important point as well. Like you've got some places in this data set, you know, going back a hundred, about a hundred years from 1930, you know, a little over 100 years from 1913 to 2024. Um, you've got a lot of places here where you're looking at 3.5, 3.75% positive term premium just between uh, three month and 10 year securities. And and you just don't see that in the era before. I mean, it, it never happens. Um, well, yeah, so- I mean, just I, I love this, this last graph that, you know, we would have flashed up folks, obviously. Again, for those driving around the treadmill or something, sorry, you're missing out. There's some <laughs> lovely graphs here that we're looking at. But yeah, I, I like how you, I mean, it was crystal clear, you know, in the one show in the two different series, but just by you just graphing the spread, just to show Jason that clearly the trend of that is upward over time, that you know what I mean? Like that, that chart is clearly going up over time, meaning the 10 year minus the short term is definitely increasing. Yeah. Meaning the, you know, the quote normalness of it being an upward sloping yield curve is, is, is a moving target and it just keeps going up over time. Yeah. And they doubled down on it in world war two, right? So in world war two, they pegged uh, the two ends of the yield curve. So the the treasury is issuing bills at that point. And what the Fed did was they basically pegged the uh, the three month bill at about one percent, and then they pegged the ten year at about two uh, two two and a quarter, something like that. So not only did did this change in like macroeconomic policy happen, but then you established this precedent during the war years that if all banks do is borrow short and lend long and they don't have to take any credit risk, then they're going to pocket 1.25%. So they really establish this whole market structure that's just built around, you know, this upward sloping curve during these, I would call it this crucial, you know, 20 year period from 1930 to 1950. And then lo and behold, that's what we consider normal now. And and one last observation here, and we're, I realize we're just about out of time. If we just flash the uh that i'm speaking now to the our tech guy when he listens to this and then superimposes up that that the the new york commercial paper rate one and use tenure you can just see that that blue line which is showing the you know the short term rates from 1871 through 1915 with it just you know some few very rapid spikes upward it's pretty consistent like it's just bouncing up and down in a very narrow band Right. But then after that, like the it's off to the races and it goes all the way down to basically zero and then all the way up to 18% and then all the way down to zero again. I mean, it's pretty clear 
that interest rates are all over the place once the Fed gets more active. Yeah. I, yeah. And that's something that I didn't even really uh, appreciate when I kind of put this together. But yeah, you're right. They kind of gyrate between four and six percent, uh, but they don't veer out of that band very much. You're saying even the Bank the of early, England's- In the first phase. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. From 1871 to 1914. Even the, uh, I'd say the bank rate in the UK uh, for actually a long time, it kind of bounces between two and four. Um, doesn't get very high above that. Uh, so yeah, it's just in general, a lot, a lot more stable. And, so, and maybe yeah, one last point. thing to say is one might have thought in general that with all, you know, the financial innovations and things like that with, you know, more sophisticated financial markets and derivatives and blah, 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 that everything would just get much more stable and predictable over time. But yet we've seen it's blown. So I, what I'm saying is I think, you know, the development of the financial sector and, you know, humans studying markets and learning more offset that I think the central banks are even more disruptive in introducing volatility than these charts even recognize as the humans are like trying to grapple with it and using other things to try to contain just how much uncertainty the central bank has introduced. But I guess yeah. we can't prove that. Yeah. Th that's the difficult thing is, uh, all, all, I think all of this analysis is kind of difficult to put a 100%, uh, hundred percent, like we win stamp on. Uh, cause again, we don't have a real yield curve. So that that's one challenge, but uh, I mean, I, there's enough evidence for me just looking at this to just say, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. The central base control short-term interest rates. I think that's well within their purview. Yeah. And also <laughs> that was, I'm glad you went there. Cause that's literally what the last question I wanted to ask as we wrap up here is just putting the charts and just taking a step back and to say, this is the way I handle it. I'm wondering, Jason, you know, what, what your reaction would be. Um, if we're wondering, because again, the the people, and it's not just like Gam and others too. Um, what's his name? I think John Carney says this kind of stuff. Like they start saying, you know, in, in the modern world, you know, central banks really, they're just a blip. They're just kind of, you know, bit, they don't really, you know, it's it's the, the international bond markets and the, you know, that kind of, and that, I guess that's true to to some extent, you know, that like the Fed, I think is less powerful now than it was 15 years ago in an absolute sense. Mm -hmm. But still like, they they're definitely very powerful and like okay if they're impotent i'll take the printing press I'll, let's put it in my basement and, I, and i'll go ahead and, and and not have any influence on world markets I, I'll, right. I'll take that you know I'll, I'll take that thing you know the the shooting blank the gun that shoots blanks yeah. or whatever but so you're, you'll be okay with that right because yeah. you don't think the central bank has any influence so why don't you just give me the reins and right it'll be right. fine it'll be right. the same so I, and I, I'm, I'm 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 not trying to disparage or like put words in their mouth or, you know, make, but sure. I'm just saying some of the particular arguments I've seen to say central banks are impotent is like, well, then why do they still exist? You know, it seems like mm -hmm. the governments are pretty protective of them. And when Ron Paul or Thomas Mass or someone comes along talking about ending the fed, everyone loses their minds about that would be disastrous. And I don't think it's because, Oh, actually they are impotent and the people losing their minds, you know, are wrong. I, I, I mean, they're they're wrong, but for the wrong reason. If you get what I'm saying, <laughs> that no, right. the yeah. the institution that controls the printing press that gives it extraordinary power. You get to create money and buy stuff by printing up, you know, electronic money. That that's pretty powerful. And I think when you do it at the scale that central banks are doing it, yeah, of course that's going to screw everything up. Do you have any yeah. any final words? Maybe that are it's more academic than what I just said. Um, well, I, I would just say like, uh, modern examples of, uh, that kind of solidify my thinking on this is, okay, we just, we've seen varying periods of negative interest rates on long-term government bonds in Germany and Japan, you know, ba basically Europe and Japan. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining like two people who have different explanations for this. Uh, one of them is, Aust you know, let's call him Austrian person. And he says, well, the, the long term interest rates went negative because the central bank said that we're going to make our short term policy rate negative and we're going to buy as many bonds as we possibly have to to keep that long-term yield super low. And by the way, we have infinite resources because we can just keep hitting this button and buying more bonds as long as we have to. Uh, that's to some extent what 
what happened in Europe, but to an exact extent, what happened in Japan. So Japan does yield curve control. They say the yield is going to be this, and we're going to buy as many government bonds as it takes to make the yield this. So if you want to challenge that, good luck. And if you try to fight the Bank of Japan on that, you lose. Um, and so the, the, the guy over here, uh, guy number two, um, who's saying, you know, Fed is impotent. He says, no, 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 no. The reason that, uh, long-term interest rates dipped in negative in, you know, during the post GF, uh, post financial crisis era is because there was this big flight to safety and there was a change in investor preference. And suddenly everybody's willing to accept a negative yield on long-term European and Japanese government paper. Look, guy number one is obviously easier to believe. Like, I, I can't, like, the second explanation just does not compute with me. And it's one of those things that, like, I, I, I shouldn't really have to make a mathematical proof for. It just makes no sense, right? <laughs> like, like, negative interest rates on long-term government paper, like, you'll accept a negative interest rate for 10 years, uh, that doesn't like that doesn't compute without there being a central bank that is going to keep interest rate their interest rate negative for a significant period of time. Like, it just I don't know. Um, it, this the the way that we're understanding it here, I think that yeah, the central bank does have a significant amount of power over interest rates. Just it seems especially combined with what we've looked at today, just seems to be the more logical route, easier to explain this stuff. So, Okay. Well, yeah, I think that's a good place to end. So my guest uh, this week, folks, has been Jason Purcell. Jake, Jason, thanks so much for your all the work you put into this and uh, taking the time to walk us through it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.